Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Space Power Forum. We're really pleased to have with us today General James Dickinson, the commander of U.S. Space Command. Now, as most of you know, but some of you might not, the U.S. Space Command is a unified combatant command responsible for conducting operations in, from, and to space to deter conflict, and if necessary, defeat aggression, deliver space combat power during joint or combined force operations, and defend U.S. allies and partners' vital interests. Prior to his current role, General Dickinson served as Deputy Commander, U.S. Space Command, and Commander, U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command. So welcome, General Dickinson, and thank you very much for making time to join us today. And what I'd like to do to kick things off is to give you an opportunity to share your thoughts with some opening remarks for our audience. So over to you. Hey, well, thanks, General Deptula, uh, for that kind introduction and the Mitchell Institute Space Power Center of Excellence invitation this morning to discuss space power during your uh, Schriever Space Power Forum series. I also appreciate your flexibility today in allowing me to dial in rather than be there in person. Uh, you know, we've got a little snow on the ground here in Colorado Springs, but someone once said that uh, flexibility is the key to air power. And that can, I think, also apply to space power as well. Well said. So I'm looking forward to addressing this audience uh, representing the national security space community. I reviewed the audience list, attendee list this morning, and I'm impressed by the caliber and quite frankly, the diversity of those watching or listening in live this morning. So given the series theme of space power, let me begin with an assertion. And that assertion is military space power exists to preserve freedom of access to and freedom of action in space. This is the priority of all joint and combined military space forces. Such freedom is gained and maintained by space superiority, the obje primary objective of space warfare. In sum, space superiority is a condition where we've secured freedom of action in the domain while denying, denying freedom of action to the adversary. It is designed to give us a strategic, operational, and tactical advantage. Space superiority requires coordinated offensive, and defensive operations. The ability to operate without prohibitive interference is associated with defensive operations. The ability to deny an opponent's freedom of action is often associated with offensive operations. Importantly, offensive and defensive operations are conducted across all three segments of the space architecture, ground, link, and space. Response options to an initial attack do not have to occur in the same segment. A critical requirement to gaining space superiority is space domain awareness. While space situational awareness produces knowledge, space domain awareness achieves understanding. The key to understanding is the ability to characterize activities in the space domain. Another critical requirement to maintaining space superiority is US Space Command's joint allied and partnered approach to space operations. Our coalition approach affords us redundant capability and creates the dilemmas for our adversaries. In this way, space superiority is a critical component of integrated deterrence. Threats to US and allied interests in space are substantial, and I think we can all agree growing. Our strategic competitors are prepared to contest the domain. Specifically, China and Russia are rapidly developing and demonstrating space and counter space capabilities designed to deny the United States our allies and partners, the advantages derived from space. In response to the rapidly changing strategic environment, U.S. Space Command is leveraging today's space power and new ways to achieve greater effects. As a combatant commander, my outlook is about two to three years to fulfill my unified command plan assigned responsibilities. Because of the speed of competition with China and Russia, I cannot wait for new capabilities over the next five-year fight up. So today I'm looking for what is good enough today that I can use right now. How can we get the most out of what we have today? So as the, eight, the DOD Global Sensor Manager, my intent is to maximize existing capabilities through integration to deliver enhanced effects in the space domain. To further our efforts, I am most interested in filling operational capability and capacity gaps in two mutually supporting mission areas, space and missile defense. 
integrating joint and interagency multi-mission sensors plus non-traditional commercial capabilities into an integrated sensor network will enhance space domain awareness characterization of activities in space. First, we are integrating space and missile defense sensors into one architecture. Second, we are integrating non-standard commercial sensors into one network. This battle management system will link operational and tactical level planners, allowing them to choose the right platform to deliver the right effects at the right time. So think sen sensor to shooter or sensor to decision maker. So I am championing the creation of an integrated sensor network for several reasons. We are doing this to shrink the kill wet, to understand more fully and decide more quickly with confidence. We are doing this to provide operators with relevant data to inform tactical decisions at the speed of relevance. We are doing this to enable joint force commanders to find, fix, track, engage, and assess. And we are doing this to empower any sensor, best shooter, decision to support, to combat commanders, the Secretary of Defense, and the national level leadership. So notably, the transition of the space traffic management mission to the Department of Commerce will allow US Spacecom to focus its resources on enhanced space domain awareness for space superiority. So again, my priority is getting the most out of the capabilities we have today, but it doesn't end there. Our ability and requirement to secure freedom of action in space will eventually extend beyond the geocentric regime. In that regard, US Space Command is closely tracking the developments in cis lunar space. Over time, we will prepare to ensure responsible, peaceful, and sustainable access for, for exploration and development beyond geo. Without a doubt, access to cis lunar space will be essential for long-term US prosperity and security. So with that introduction, uh, Dave, I'm happy to elaborate more as we begin the question and answer. No, thanks very much for that uh, context and uh, insight. Uh, and thanks again for everything that your uh, team's doing to uh, uh, deter attack as well as protect and defend our, our vital system. So let's jump right in. Um, recently, uh, Mitchell Institute hosted our first annual space security forum where we had a substantial number of representatives uh, from uh, allied uh, uh, space uh, organizations. Now, Secretary Austin and you have both stressed partnerships. Um, could you talk to our audience a bit and explain how Spacecom integrates allies and partners into your operations? Sure. Well, since, since we stood up, you know, back in 2019, now we're three years, all of three years old, uh, Space Command has been uh, a team of mutually supporting teams. So we understand the fight for and from space is a joint global and multi-domain effort. Our operational approach is joint, combined, and partnered because our mission success, I think, relies on the relationship we build with the joint force, U.S. government agencies, our allies and partners, and partners in the industry and academia. We have uh, allied officers embedded throughout uh, the command. For example, uh, my deputy J5 for strategy plans and policy is a UK brigadier. And we've had him for almost a year now. And we have others throughout the command and in our field units. So, uh, you know, simply put, you know, allied and partner is not new to the DOD uh, space enterprise. You know, uh, you know, Air Force Space Command and, you know, the old US Space Command. We've had allies and partners uh, you know, integrated into our operations at the tactical operational level for years. And we had a lot of um, uh, allies and partners out at Combined Force Space Component Command at Vandenberg Space Force Space. But what's new is we're bringing them into the COCOM headquarters now. So as I mentioned, I've got a UK Brit, I've also got a French Colonel, uh, and we're expanding that as quickly as we can. And really the, uh, the appetite or the interest by our allies and partners to, to provide more of that, more of that liaison and that exchange type of officers uh, into the command is growing. Uh, there's no, no doubt about that. Our uh, Operation Olympic Defender really is our formal, though, mechanism for combined space operations with our allies and partner nations. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, we have about space sharing agreements we have with over 30 nations now, and that's growing. Uh, U.S. Space Command, we, we must fill, you know, our capacity and capability uh, challenges to deter and ultimately defeat anyone who would do us harm. So like any other combatant command, 
my focus is for the next two to three years, and we don't have the luxury to wait for capabilities, as I mentioned earlier in my remarks. So our, you know, and I think we all agree our strategic competitors are not waiting for that. So let me talk a little bit about the commercial mission partners. So as of today, we've got about 120 commercial mission partners working with us. We have a commercial integration cell out at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Uh, we call that the SIC is a uh, facility or an area where commercial entities have operations consoles that are side by side with our military operators, exchanging information really near real time. So it now includes 10 commercial partners out there and Vandenberg. Likewise, here in Colorado Springs, we have a commercial operations cell that supports the Joint Task Force Space Defense. Uh, it integrates with us for space defense measures. This cell uh, enables real-time synergy and information exchange between our owner operators and tactical users. This information exchange ensures that our industry partners and our operators can rapidly and accurately respond to anomalies on orbit, share valuable lessons, and improve our overall readiness. So I'd like, to, as an example of that, I'd like to mention one of our commercial mission partners' success stories when one of them provided some very relevant operational space domain awareness capability. So back in last January, uh, this partner tracked the Chinese uh, satellite SJ-21 and the Beidou uh, satellite during their rendezvous and proximity operations, uh, docking and maneuver release. Uh, when SJ-21 broke away, the commercial partner quickly tracked its movement 300 kilometers above GEO and, and watched it return. It's because a commercial company in this example did this that I can talk about it with, uh, without really uh, revealing any type of classified information. So this is critical as we increase our space domain awareness capability as well as capacity. So as a result of that, you know, you can imagine that we've had a, you know, a very big expansion or growth in our commercial integration. So we've had to develop a new commercial integration strategy so that we can work with these commercial partners that want to come and be part of, you know, uh, both our commercial integration cell out at Vandenberg, as well as the one here in Colorado Springs. So just to kind of clarify between the two, the one out in Vandenberg is predominantly satellite communications. The one here, commercial integration cell in Colorado Springs is predominantly space domain awareness. So those are really two big, big uh, pieces to the commercial part of it. We also continue to work with uh, academia. Uh, we, uh, we call this our academic en engagement enterprise. Uh, we work very closely with the Space Force and what they're doing in the academic world as well. But we all know that uh, we can get some incredible talent as we uh, work with these institutions to bring them into the command or into the Space Force. So we spend a lot of time doing that as well. So that's really kind of a wrap up. So allies and partners, the commercial integration piece, and then academia are key to what we're doing uh, each and every day. And we're expanding that as quickly as we possibly can. Wow, that's a great rundown, and uh, I think, uh, you know, the old saying goes, uh, when we go to fight, we don't fight alone, we fight with uh, partners, and uh, obviously you've done uh, a lot to ensure that integration occurs, not just on the fly, but to prep so that when conflict does occur, you're already set. Um, the other observations you were chatting there and talking about using the example of the uh, uh, movement of a uh, commercial sat outside of uh, geo in that one instance, I think it's becoming really evident uh, to most everyone in watching the conflict in Ukraine evolve, just how critical commercial space is, both in the context of um, ISR uh, as well as communications. Uh, but let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about uh, organizational issues. Uh, U.S. Space Force leadership recently announced that they're going to be standing up Space Force components in all the major terrestrial geographic combatant commands. And last week, they stood up the first one at Indo-PACOM. At the same time, uh, your organization, Spacecom, already has presence in all the combatant commands through your joint integrated space teams, or GIST. Um, what are the differences between the two? Uh, from both a, a Title 10 and a, a unified command plan standpoint. Yeah, so uh, I, I saw that too. And, uh, um, you know, I applaud and congratulate the Space Force for standing up their first space service component in Indo-PACOM. I uh, believe that's the right place at the right time for, uh, for that, uh, 
that element to stand up. And, uh, and really in terms of what the, the plan is for the future, I'd probably defer back to the Space Force because I, I think I know what it is, but I don't want to go on the record and say what that is today. But I will tell you, I think uh, speaking for U.S. Space Command, you know, we uh, at the very beginning, we created some uh, elements, what we call today, they were called operational planning elements when we first stood up back in 19. But, uh, you know, like any good organization, we have to, as we grew and mature those OPEs in each of the combatant commands, we found out that they did more than just operational planning. We found out that they did more, you know, they did a lot of uh, operations, planning, and, uh, and intelligence type of work. So we, uh, we renamed them, we labeled them. And so they're called the Joint Integrated Space Teams. Um, they're composed of joint space officers and embedded them in all 10 geographic combatant commands. You know, and as we continue to grow, they're at various levels of manning within the, each of the COCOMs, but you can, everybody in this audience will probably understand where we stood those up first and where they're probably the most mature. Uh, and I would say uh, that would be into a PACOM at this point. Um, and so they're really more than just liaison teams. These are the elements from US Space Command. They're integrated members of those headquarters where, as I mentioned, planning, operations, training, and exercises. Uh, the GISTs, my GISTs help my fellow combatant commanders with the access to space capabilities and creation of space effects to aid in their scheme of maneuver. So they also advise the joint force on how to operate in a degraded or denied operating environment, as well as how U.S. Space Command can assist in preventing an adversary from affecting them from space. So as these elements uh, stand up, um, for the U.S. Space Force, that is just, I think, a win for the overall joint team, because now you will have uh, you will have those uh, those or that those organizations in each of the combatant commands working with our GISTs. So really, think of the GIST at the strategic level, uh, working you know uh, horizontally with uh, other COCOMs uh, with regards to space, and then you've got the service components will be you know, organic into that respective geographic command that can provide space uh, support as well. Very good. Um, staying on the subject of organization for a minute, every regional combatant command has service component uh, elements uh, that bring their domain specific capabilities to support the particular combatant commands, regional engagement, deterrence and warfighting missions. Um, do you have the same arrangement there at uh, uh, U.S. Space Command? Yeah, so now we have, uh, uh, we have now five service component commands assigned to the command. So I've got Army, Navy, and Air Force. I'll, I'll get onto that. I'll more specific on that. Marines, uh, let me see, Army, Air Force, Marines, Navy, and Space Force. And of course, Space Force, which is the Space Operations Command, is, my, is the newest one, but not necessarily the newest one to the command. Uh, so we have those three, and then I've got three functional component commands, which is Joint Task Force Space Defense, uh, Combined Force Space Component Command. Everybody recognizes that. And then just uh, on the 15th of November, I established a Combined Force, uh, Combined Joint Task Force Space Operations uh, last week. And so uh, there was an announcement on that that came out. So just one thing I'll just talk about briefly is how we have those component commands and why we would have an Air Force service component. There's, there does seem to be some, um, you know, why would you have an Air Force component when you have a Space Force component? And really it's kind of an interesting one that a lot of people uh, may or may not know that, you know, I am the DOD Human Space Flight Support Manager for the Department of Defense. And so uh, think of the Artemis that just launched uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, out to the moon, a lap around the moon, coming back, it will land, uh, you know, I believe on or, on or around the 11th of December in the Pacific Ocean. Well, the coordination of the recovery of the capsule, and the, although there's no astronauts on this particular flight, um, we, U.S. Space Command, are responsible for coordinating the recovery of the uh, soon-to-be the astronauts once they start manning or crewing the, uh, the capsule and then the recovery of that capsule. And so think of the days back when you watch, you know, uh, Apollo 13 or the space shuttle or things like that, we're back in that uh, business of being able to provide, quite frankly, global uh, uh, recovery, human spaceflight support for, for NASA and the nation. So our Air Force space component helps us with that. They have the mission of doing that. And so uh, we're pretty excited about that. That'll again, like I said, happen on the 11th of December. 
no crew, but uh, one of the top priorities, I think, for Administrator Nelson and NASA is the recovery of that capsule uh, intact so that they can uh, evaluate the heat shield. And uh, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, so let me let me pause for a minute. Let's see. The other piece um, uh, that I want to mention a little bit is, you know, you know, things that I look for from my service components is, is uh, you know, if, you, if I were to look at an example, that would be uh, cyber capabilities, for example. So as we look at uh, today and into the future, uh, and given what I described in my earlier remarks about the the ground link or the, the ground, the link and the space piece to the space system, you know, we're very, very uh, interested in making sure that we are accounting for cyber as well. And so what's interesting about the organizational architecture that I have right now is that two, two of my five components, service components are dual hatted as cyber as well. So my MAR4 space is really my MAR4 cyber. And so NAV space is NAV cyber as well. And so both uh, Vice Admiral Clapperton, as well as uh, Major General Heritage, both work for Paul Makassoni as a Cybercom commander, as well as me. And so that automatically almost makes a, a natural synergy there to synchronize, coordinate those types of activities. In addition to that, uh, we stood up a joint cyber center here in the command. So that is established and working today. And of course, I've got a couple, of, I got a planning element from uh, U.S. Cybercom embedded in my headquarters as well. So, just kind of an example. So, five service components, full, you know, fully uh, performing their mission of organize, train, and equip. I've got cyber embedded within the command as well, and uh, and uh, and so we're and we're moving forward on that. No, thanks very much. Now, in you mentioned your um, reorganization at the Spacecom, establishing the Combined Joint Task Force Space Operations. Um, the commander of this Combined Joint Task Force is going to serve at the operational level of command with tactical control of presented space forces. In addition, the command is going to have a joint staff assigned. And so my question here is, will this be a separate staff from the current uh, U.S. Spacecom staff, or will they be a group of folks who are chopped over to support uh, the CJTF uh, space operations. Yeah, so we'll have a, it'll have its, uh, uh, you know, its own internal, it'll have its own internal staff. Uh, composition of that we've worked work, work very closely, very hard on. Really, this has been something we've been working on for about a year and a half, almost two years through exercises, um, as well as deliberate, deliberate planning efforts. And so we think it'll have its own joint staff. Right now, it is. I stood it up as a headquarters, and so we're and we're doing that purposefully so that we can uh, we can establish itself in terms of its functions and roles and missions and make sure we have it right uh, before we actually, you know, uh, declare IOC. So right now, it, we're working through those issues. We're working through those topics right now, but it will actually provide us uh, greater agility and flexibility within the command to do, you know you know, space operations. So in other words, uh, it will be able to synchronize, you know, both what we do from a space enabling perspective, as well as what we do for a protect and defend on orbit. So this will be a, a level of command that will actually provide uh, more agility, more flexibility, more unity of effort, unity of command than I could do so from a, a four-star COCOM staff. Okay, great. A little bit, uh, just a bit of a follow-up. Um, you mentioned unity of effort. How do you envision the unity of effort that will be gained by having a, both the JTF space defense and the combined forces space component respective operation centers reporting uh, to the uh, combined joint task force? Well, I think so. There, there are some, uh, like you would expect in any other domain, there are some mission areas that, that potentially overlap between those two uh, headquarters now, those two commands. And so the purpose of CJTFSO will be, as most higher headquarters, will be the synchronization of those missions and the synchronization of those resources. Uh, do you see any possible efficiencies by combining the op centers from both of these organizations sometime in the future? Those are things that we're looking at right now. So those are those are things as a, so I kind of look at it, you know, step by step. So step one was to get this organization established. Uh, we have not declared IOC on it yet. Uh, and so as we look to develop 
you know, the, the, the POEM or the road ahead to, to IOC, as part of that, we will be looking at all those different uh, aspects that you, you're talking about right now, uh, whether or not we need two, need, need two command centers, whether they could be one. I mean, those are all options that we're looking at right now, which is good. So I've got some, uh, some pretty talented and smart uh, officers that are looking at those problem sets. And as we established on the 15th of November, now they've got clear direction to go look at that and report back, and then we'll make some decisions as we go along. Oh, thank you for that. Now, recent reports, uh, and you mentioned earlier, uh, have shown that there's progress being made with the transition of the space traffic management activities to the Department of Commerce. Um, where are you in that process? And will this be a clean break um, or will U.S. Spacecom still have a role in this function? Well, so the uh, DOD Department of Commerce Memorandum of Agreement uh, was co-signed, I think it was on 9 September. And, uh, and we, U.S. Space Command, we, are fully, we fully support the Department of Commerce as they assume the responsibilities really to independently execute space traffic management. Now, that's, that's a little bit in the future, uh, and I don't have a hard uh, date time group when that will happen, but the, uh, the agreement will eventually relieve Space Command from the, what we call the non-defense related collision notifications that we do currently. You know, we, we notify any affected nation or commercial entity of debris that could pose a risk to their spacecraft. And commerce will be assuming that role while we get after the why of an action, actions that often lead to further debris, for example. So US, it, that will that'll allow us the flexibility to, to double our efforts, if you will, to enhance our space domain awareness. And, and again, as I said in my earlier comments, when you talk about space situational awareness, which is really, you know, where is it? Report out. Will it will it collide, or does it have the potential to collide with anything else? Uh, as that space situational awareness, that is really kind of a fundamental blocking and tackling, if you will. What we want to get after with the Department of Commerce picking up space traffic management is getting to space domain awareness, which, as I mentioned earlier, is the understanding the characterization of what's happening uh, on orbit. And so using our assets to do more of that, uh, particularly as we, as we watch the, uh, um, you know, the advancements, uh, proliferation by the, the Chinese and the Russians uh, on orbit. The other piece to it is, um, is uh, just the growth of uh, debris and things that we track on orbit today. Uh, you know, just a statistic uh, is that back, you know, in two, 2019, when we stood up, we tracked about 25,000 pieces of debris, objects, you know, old satellites, defunct satellites, rocket bodies, you know, pieces you know, of, of satellites that are falling apart. Um, that was about 25,000. Today, it's about 48,000. So the, the dramatic increase in the number of items that we have to track today, you can only, you know, deduce very easily, you know, how complicated that has become, how congested it has become become. And so uh, we are, you know, open arms, welcoming, working hand in hand with the uh, Department of Commerce to, to work on their ability and their, their progress and being able to, uh, to do the space traffic management mission. And we're working very closely with them. So we're, we're encouraged by that. Uh, and we, we certainly welcome, welcome that, uh, that partnership with them. And we will, we will continue to work with them. So it won't be a, you know, you know, once we once we transition, we will have to work hand in hand because you can imagine that you know, it's all about data and uh, we'll have a huge data repository that we will all have to be able to use. And so we'll be working with them on that as well. Oh, very good, a kind of a related question and one that you mentioned earlier in your remarks, I, I think it extraordinarily important and people are aware of the fact that Space.com provides both uh, space situa uh, situational awareness and space domain awareness. And um, I thought you had a really good um, explanation, uh, but I think it's something worth uh, elaborating on. Uh, could, could you uh, help our uh, audience understand the differences between the two and then what Space, Com space Command actually provides to do both? Well, so uh, the difference between space domain awareness, again, uh, and space situation awareness. Um, one is, you know, I, if, I, if I had to use an analogy, you know, space situational awareness is a little bit like uh, doing air traffic control. Uh, 
So it's, it's where are the airplanes, where are the satellites, reporting that into a, a, a open database where uh, you know, the public can have access to it to ensure, you know, in this case, an allergy, sp uh, safe uh, air, air flight or safe operations of aircraft. It's the same in my mind as space situational awareness. It, it is how do you, and as we watch the proliferation of the commercial industry with all these satellites, thousands of satellites in low earth orbit, it'll become increasingly more important that you're able to uh, identify that quickly, report out quickly, so that uh, these companies and, and uh, government agencies will know, you know what the situation is, the operating environment is in the space domain. That's a very, uh, um, you know, in my words, kind of an administrative thing. So um, now, if you compare that to space domain awareness, that's a couple of steps beyond that in terms of being able to identify characteristics uh, more closely, more accurately on what maybe actually is that, is that satellite moving for a reason? Is it moving? What, what is it doing? What kind of capabilities does it have on it? Uh, all those kinds of things, similar to what you would do in the air domain. So, you know, the, the U.S. Air Force doesn't track every single aircraft, but they track the ones that, they're, they're, that are of interest to them. It would be the same for us. We'll track the ones and pay the most attention to the ones that we have interest in. While, while the FAA or while, while the Department of Commerce would do that for space traffic management in their particular case. So that's kind of that's kind of where I look at doing that. You know, we continue in U.S. Space Command to uh, to provide that. Uh, what I just taught. We we have a website called the SpaceTrack.org where we report out the out on those kinds of uh, in, uh, events. And uh, you know, just to go back to the Artemis, for example, you know, we work very closely with uh, with uh, NASA uh, when they get ready to to do a launch like Artemis in terms of making sure we do quite quite frankly, space traffic management. We make sure that given launch times, given what we project as the trajectory of the, the rocket, et cetera, that you know, everything's clear and safe as they get ready to get, uh, get, uh, get underway. We also do the same thing for the International Space Station. And so we've got uh, great uh, guardians out at uh, Vandenberg Space Force Base in the 18th Space Defense Squadron that do that every day, all day, making sure that uh, you know, given the volume of debris I just mentioned earlier, 48,000 or so pieces of debris, that the uh, International Space Station is safe. And so we work, we work hand in hand uh, with NASA to make sure that we do that each and every day. But that's really kind of, you know, the difference between space domain awareness and space situational awareness. No, thank you for that. Um, and it is amazing how, how many the explosive growth, if you will, in terms of uh, assets that are out there. I mean, 2019 just seemed like the other day. Uh, and you have almost a, a doubling of uh, elements that you got to deal with. Um, shifting well, towards China. But we got to be careful sorry. about you got to be careful about talking about explosions in space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll have to change that word anyway. Uh, China. China, um, they've been working toward exploiting uh, maneuver advantages. You alluded to one of them uh, in space, both in uh, Earth orbit and out in cislunar space. So what's SpaceCom doing or advocating for in the joint requirements process so that the United States can have a maneuver advantage in space? Well, orbital warfare, I think, is a form of dynamic uh, space operations, which, which requires maneuver. Uh, while traditional space missions were more focused on service delivered on services delivered on schedule, DSO or the dynamic space operations are becoming more prevalent, and I think important to U.S. Space Command in our objectives. So DSO are those that require a space platform to frequently and quickly act as a part of its readiness campaign or its tactical and strategic missions. DSO may include frequency, agility, rapid software updates, some types of a responsive launch, maneuver, and expanding, expanding hardware. So the, the subset of DSO, those that require consumables, limits our ability to test, train, exercise, message, and operate effectively. So that the use of consumables now carries with it uh, what we call a regret, that we can't use it later a uh, constraint that U.S. Space Command can't continue to be held to. 
uh, given, given the environment uh, that we see today. Therefore, I think we must uh, break the strong linkage between consumables and DSOs, greatly expanding our ability to keep pace with the threat and meet our UCP responsibilities. So the joint forces ability, I think, to project and employ military power is predicated on the continuous availability of space-based capabilities. So superior space combat power forces and capabilities, I think enable the lethality of the joint force and provide independent options to the joint force commanders in our national leadership. So we will continue to appropriately posture, uh, deploy and employ scalable space combat powers to detect, attribute and respond to threats. So I really like the tactically responsive space concept. So we need you know, commercial mission partners to build the capabilities to replenish our military space assets, such as the rapid preparation of rockets and payloads and conducting immediate launch turnarounds. Uh, and we, we are seeing that in the commercial industry right now for multiple and varied launch locations and platforms. So space doctrine for our orbital warfare is, that, is quite frankly kind of in its infancy and demands our joint force collaboration with our allies and partners to design a dynamic, dynamic employment tactics, techniques, and procedures for space operations. Well, that's great. Uh, General Dickinson, we, obviously we could, we could go on for a long time here just between you and I. What I'd like to do is um, open the session to questions from our audience listeners uh, as you've drawn uh, quite a large audience. So I want to give them plenty of time. Uh, as a reminder to our listeners, you can participate uh, by chat in the Q&A uh, element or function of the app or use the raise hand function. So please, uh, when I call on you, unmute your mic and uh, let me know your name and affiliation, then go ahead and direct your uh, a question to uh, John Dickinson. Let's start with uh, John Watkins. John? Okay, we'll come back to you, John. How about Sandra Irwin? Hi, good afternoon. Oh, good morning, uh, General Dickinson. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I wanted to pick up on uh, Dave Deptula's um, earlier question on the establishment of the Space Force uh, service component in, in the PACOM. Um, it's a little bit confusing uh, for us to understand um, how space support is provided, will be provided to Indo PACOM. Uh, for example, um, when the commander of Indo-PACOM needs space capabilities, do they go to you or now that there's a space force uh, component, will they go to them? And how, you know, how do you make sure that, that those services that they need are provided in, an, in, in, a, time, um, in a timely manner? Uh, if you can explain that, that would be super helpful. Thank you. Sure, thanks for the question, Sandra. Um, so I think what I try to do is, uh, in order to kind of clarify that, explain that, I want to draw an analogy. So if you were to think of, so you look at US Indo-PACOM now, you've got service componencies from all the, all the services now. The newest, as you mentioned, was US Space Force with their Space Service Component Command out there. So when uh, the Indo-PACOM commander looks to, to do uh, maneuver on the ground, in the ground domain, for example, he looks to uh, a guy named Lieutenant or General Charlie Flynn, the United States Army Pacific commander. And so he would look, he looks to him for all things that would go on in the ground domain. He Likewise, he looks at uh, PACAF for everything, Air Forces in the Pacific. Same with MAR-4 PAC and same as PAC fleet for the Navy. So Indo-PACOM commander will look to that service component, space service component for, you know, all things space, if you will, in terms of support of his operations in his respective AOR in the Indo-PACOM AOR. What will happen at that point will be the, the normal integration and coordination that would happen, that just has, has happened, is happening right now between that component and U.S. Space Command in terms of making sure that we provide the space enabling capabilities that the Indo-PACOM commander needs uh, in support of his operations. So, so basically, there's not going to be another layer uh, in the process. The, the the establishment of the space force component does not create another layer of bureaucracy, so to speak. That's not 
that's not how it's supposed to work, correct? No, we no, there will be no there won't be an additional layer. This is actually enhancing uh, the relationship, if you will, between Indo-PACOM and US uh, Space Command, mm -hmm. given that uh, Space Service Component Command. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, John Dickinson, I'm going to, I see John Watkins has uh, uh, asked his question here on chat. Could you please share your thoughts on what the command's role might be regarding support of interagency efforts to advance scientific exploration and economic development activities in cislunar space as described in the White House strategy for interagency research on cislunar space activities. I'm sorry, so what's, I'm sorry, Dave, what's the bottom line on that? The, the bottom line is what is the command's role regarding efforts to advance development in cislunar space uh, as described in the White House's recent uh, strategy for cislunar space activities? Yeah, I, you know, uh, being a pretty new strategy, I think it just came out in the last couple of weeks. You know, we're, we're still working our way through that at this point. Uh, I guess my, uh, my answer to that would be that, you know, we will work to support those efforts, uh, you know, whole of government wise and however they decide they want to try to approach that. I, I do think it's a very important area that we need to look at. Uh, we are looking at that. Um, I will tell you right at this point, though, our focus has been, quite frankly, uh, making sure that we're getting the assets and the organizational structure right to do what we're doing today. But uh, as we look to the future, we'll support the, that strategy um, as, as required. Uh, okay, we got one from Dongjong Park. What role do you think Space Command can play in responding to threats such as North Korea's potential nuclear tests or intercontinental ballistic missile launches? Um, and how do you think creating uh, U.S. Space Command affects uh, operations in the Indo-Pacific Command and U.S. Forces Korea? So uh, um, we are working as, I think I mentioned it in my opening remarks, is uh, we're looking at how we integrate a sensor architecture that gives us as much warning as possible in terms of any type of missile activity out of North Korea. And so we're, we're looking at uh, US assets that we have today that uh, may not have been originally designed for uh, space domain awareness in some, in some cases. And uh, we're looking at how we can look at the sensors that we have today in the Department of Defense, integrate those into an architecture where we pr can provide you know, both the United States and our allies and partners as much advanced warning as possible. We're also looking at how we can uh, incorporate commercial sensors in the same respect to be able to do that, to provide that missile warning. I have the UCP responsibilities as the global sensor manager. So, uh, so within the Department of Defense, uh, I am able to kind of orchestrate that and synchronize those efforts. And uh, we continue to work that every day. We exercise it every day, but uh, we've got a, a little ways to go. The good news is, as we uh, as we talk to the other services uh, in the Department of Defense who are having capabilities that are either have presently or bringing them into production or into programs record, we might be able to uh, influence those requirements to make them better at what we need them to do in terms of both space domain awareness, missile warning, and missile defense. Uh, here's one from uh, Mike uh, Morrow. Uh, can you describe how the ongoing continuing resolution is impacting Space Command's operations and its current initiatives? Well, you've probably all seen, I'm sure, you know, the, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Austin, has, has, uh, has made that uh, very uh, uh, evident in the news, I think, as recently as yesterday. But a continuing resolution uh, um, that does not help us. Uh, it doesn't help us. Uh, in terms of uh, being able to get those capabilities that uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we need in terms of the new fight up coming out and uh, those types of things. So, you know, the faster we can get the budget uh, approved, the better it'll be for uh, not only U.S. Space Command, but the Joint Force. Uh, here's one from uh, Samantha Kirsch. Could you please elaborate on how you're looking to expand missile defense capabilities in space 
using and maximizing existing capabilities? Yeah, so um, I think I mentioned that a little bit earlier, but uh, but again, it's it's the uh, what can I do with the, how can I maximize or optimize the assets we already have in the Department of Defense, and quite frankly, uh, in the intelligence community and in the commercial industry and even academia. So how do we look at those in terms of uh, capabilities? And uh, a lot of times people say, well, it was never designed to, to do space domain awareness, for example, but it has the ability to do so. And so we are, we are actively pursuing that. We work very closely with the Missile Defense Agency uh, and they have done some remarkable work in terms of looking at sensors that uh, do solely missile defense, but how could they do space domain awareness, for example? And, uh, and I'm, in, in my words, those are inventions away in terms of hardware. Those are more like software development type of uh, activities that can give us that capability. So we continue to do that. We will continue to pursue that. We are not there yet. We've made some great progress over the last, quite frankly, we've been working on this for about three years. Uh, but you know, we've got some more work to do, but we're making good progress. And uh, really, quite frankly, I've been resourced to, to do that. Here's one from uh, uh, Tom Novelli with military.com. When can the public expect an announcement on the location for U.S. Space Command's headquarters? Uh, additionally, what, what has led to the delay in announcing the new location? Uh, so I would tell you, I, I knew I wouldn't be able to go an hour without that question. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I was flipping a quarter here thinking of when I'm going to get that question. So, uh, so I think the decision is going to come out shortly. Um, I don't have a date time group. That is a decision by the uh, Secretary of the Air Force. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know that uh, they have been doing a very deliberate analysis of uh, the two reports that came out. So we had the GAO report came out and the DODIG report came out. Um, and so with both of those reports in hand, I know that Secretary Kendall has been doing a very uh, methodical analysis of uh, those two reports. And so, uh, quite frankly, I, I look forward to the decision. All right, here's one that, uh, uh, well, you were very comfortable in answering that one too. So I, I don't think it's an issue of comfort, but Richard Mosher wants to know, uh, if you would update uh, the audience on the Spacecom relationship with the National Reconnaissance Office uh, and, and just how those uh, relationships are ongoing. Hey, so that's a great question. I get that question quite often. I usually get that question a couple of times during testimony. So a little easier here, maybe, I don't know, but uh, um, it's a very close relationship. Um, Dr. Scalise and I are very, very close uh, uh, in, in the organism tour. You know, it starts at the top, right? So if the top gets along, then everybody else, you know, kind of, but we haven't really had to do that. Yeah, ever since I took over the command almost three years ago now, we've always had a, a very close relationship. You know, working side by side at the National Space Defense Center by design for years, uh, we are seeing the, uh, really the relationship continue to uh, mature and get closer. You know, we, we exercise with them every day. We do operations with them every day. We train with them every day. And so it continues to get closer. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, if nothing else, uh, some of the um, activities by our competitors in the space domain have, uh, have uh, act actually highlighted that in terms of how we've responded. So uh, we continue to work uh, closely with them. Uh, I think as the, you know, as we've you know, stood up the CJTFSO that I described earlier. They were absolutely 100% behind what we were doing there. They understand exactly what we're trying to get to with the unity of effort, unity of command, synchronization of activities. So they're great partners, uh, and I, I think it will continue. I know it will. Excellent. Let's switch back to now an in-person question from uh, Teresa Hitchens. Thank you. Um, it's good to see you, General Dickinson. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I want to go back to Sandra's question. Um, it still seems a little uh, opaque to me how Space Force and Space Command will work together in the other regional commands. And so I wondered, will the combined Joint Task Force Space Ops actually, the new, the new um, 
operational command. Will it actually have representatives in the other regional commands? So, or or will be, or how this will work is that the Indo-PACOM commander will talk to the Space Force Component Command, who will then call the Combined Joint Task Force Space Ops Commander to coordinate how things work? Or, or will there actually be people in each of these regional commands from, from Space Command? All right, Teresa, thanks for the question. So um, the Regional Space Service Component Command, the one that just stood up, for example, in Indo-PACOM, those are guardians and uh, led by the, the, uh, the one star out there. And they, will, they work directly for the Indo-PACOM commander. But there is a coordination relationship that already exists because as, as Space Force organized those space service components, they used uh, existing guardians that were already in Indo-PACOM, they've just organized them into a uh, into a space service component command. That former organization already had a relationship with U.S. Space Command through the SIPSIC, and mm -hmm. so that relationship already exists and will continue to exist. And I I would think it will mature. Well, I know it will mature more now that they're established as a space service component command. And so again, that's the kind of the that is the relationship between the Space Service Component Command and in today uh, Combined Force Space uh, Force, the SIPSIC out at Vandenberg. So that already exists, it has existed for, for quite some time. Okay, all I have listed here on my screen is Kraft. So Kraft, over to you. Sorry about that. My phone, my microphone was muted. Uh, General, uh, I spent 30 years in China, and before that, I was at Defense Language Institute for Russian. So my question is to you: Do you see um, that? What is our situation with the uh, facing China as far as the actual? Um, are we winning or are we losing in space? Do they have more than we have? Uh, and also, are we doing, do we plan war games to identify what are our strengths and weaknesses in space? Uh, it's my viewpoint that China is the real focus for space. Um, and they are doing everything they can to increase their posturing there. Uh, you know, they, they blew up the satellite a few, a few years ago. Uh, so that told me that there was, that they are really doing so much more than maybe we are. So I'd like to hear your viewpoint on that, sir. Well, I think we've seen all the policy documents, strategies that have come out that uh, China is the, the, the pacing challenge for, the, uh, for uh, the Department of Defense, and that includes space. So uh, uh, in terms of their advancement in uh, you know, counter space activities and capabilities, they are, they are progressing. We see that in the news. Uh, we see as they they develop more and more capability to be able to uh, do global global type of operations, uh, leveraging their uh, their space capabilities. So, uh, um, they're, I, I would say they're not winning. I would say, but they're closing the gap between the United States and, and uh, the Chinese. You know, they've watched us for uh, you know many many years in Iraq and Afghanistan in terms of how how we utilize space. Uh, and how we're able to employ globally, um, you know, our capabilities. So I, uh, I would just tell you that they're they're advancing, um, and that uh, we need to be very well aware of that. We do plan for that, uh, like any any good military organization. We plan, we planned, uh, we do our planning and exercises against what we think uh, our competitors uh, have, and uh, and we do that each and every day. And as a combatant command standing up, you know, we're developing those plans and operations every day. Well, General Dickinson, uh, thanks very much for your time today. Unfortunately, we come to the end of this Space Power Forum. Uh, so we, we hope that you're feeling a little bit better uh, if, in fact, you do have the uh, flu. And to you and, your, and our audience, uh, from all of us here at the Mitchell Institute Space Power Advantage Research Center, have a great space power kind of day. Hey, thanks, Dave. I appreciate your time today and being flexible. Thank you. <laughs>